right? So now, seeing a presence of a quorum, I will call the Amherst Human Rights Commission to order at 6.35 on October 19th, 2022. I'll read my little blurb here. So pursuant to chapter 20 of Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. See instructions below. It's weird to say that out loud. No in-person attendance members of the public. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that pub the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Sorry for stumbling through that. And um, just as a point of order, I'm gonna point out that we will be putting, pushing public comment down to three so that we can give it proper time. It'll be, so three, I guess it'll be F, right under membership quorum. So we'll start off with, oh, I'm sorry, the Pamela, go ahead. Oh, I was just asking uh, Jen to make me a panelist so that you guys can see me. Got it. Thank you. Your hand is up, Pamela. Okay. Yes, yeah. Good to go. So we'll start off. Are there any uh, Human Rights Commission member reports? Anyone have anything to report? I do have a report, but I'll save mine for um, when member reports come up for CSSJC. Oh, perfect. yep. All right, so we'll start with start with the heavy. We'll go to the DEI and the police report regarding July fifth. And if I can, I think uh, I don't know if we need a motion on this, but. I, um, Pamela Lee needs to leave early, so if we could get through all of her agenda items first, then we can move forward with police report. So if we could push the police report. Okay. Yeah. Pass that. Yeah, we can push that to the last of section three here. So um, I have uh, reports to just to uh, give about the retreat, um, the Latinx Heritage Month, um, CRESS update and DEI update. And then I was going to uh, stick around for the police report if you had questions of me based on that police report. So I'll actually start with CRESS and um, we'll say at the beginning as well that um, Earl's not with us tonight, the CRESS director, but he gave a very extensive report about the CRESS um, operations at the last CSSJC meeting, which is recorded. So these are highlights from his re report, but if um, individuals want additional information, they should reach out to him or listen to that report. So in the time period between uh, 9 6, which is when uh, Crest started their operations and 9 30, uh, uh, Earl reported that they had um, 17 188 engagements, and those engagements included uh, engagements with individuals in towns, with the colleges, at the uh, town block party, um, at, um, at UMass, and at um, the high school. Uh, he talked about some notable engagements with individuals where the Crest responders were able to be of assistance um, um, at the biz, so the bid, the business, uh, Improvement District at the Survival Center. They also responded to the fire at the Amherst High School and have um, made responses to Jones Library. Uh, he discussed a wide variety of different types of calls. So mental health, trespass, senior citizen services, in addition to a uh, lots of other different types of calls that they've been able to engage in. Uh, the Crest responders, um, have been in communication with other like departments from around this, uh, the country. In particular, they're thinking about uh, modeling a data collection method after the city of uh, Minneapolis. There, uh, the responders have basically a um, tablet which allows them 
to record their interactions, record down data about the individual that they re, that they interact with, but also protect the privacy of the individual. So he's looking um, to see if there's a way in which they might be able to use similar devices. They're also thinking that they might want to have an exchange program with other uh, CRESS communities so that our responders could spend some time in another community and another community's um, responder could spend time in Amherst as a way of you know, having a learning exchange. Um, just uh, the CREST department has started holding um, social services meetings. So on a monthly basis, they're meeting with other social service agencies to review how the responders are interacting and what um, you know, services can be provided by those social services um, interactions. So I believe those are sort of the, the highlights, but I would really encourage everyone um, to listen to the CSJC meeting because Earl did a very, presented a very comprehensive report about the response and we'll try to make an effort to perhaps bring him to the next HRC meeting so that he could also provide you with um, more detailed information. Um, yeah, that for would the, be great, Pamela, if he could come to the next meeting. Mm -hmm. It'd be awesome. So as the DEI department um, report. I just want to say I'm very happy to have Jen back because I felt like I was treading water and um, barely keeping my head above water. Um, so since she's been back, uh, we have returned our attention to completing our strategic plan, um, working on uh, finishing the document that we would use for a DEI assessment with the various departments. Um, that self-assessment document, we hope to have help from the core equity team to serve as a group of um, trying to, I, I guess uh, the, the best word that I can come up with now is um, support, but that's not the best word to use. But basically members of the core equity team would be available to provide support to department heads um, help answer questions as they are completing the self-assessments for their departments. And I think that there could be a real benefit to having someone to spreading the workload around. So it's not just Jen and I answering questions. And also as departments are trying to do the self-assessment, sometimes people feel uncomfortable raising a question to the DEI director, you know, or to the department. So having another group available that they could ask questions to might feel a little bit of a lower stake, a lower risk. Um, and so that the core equity team has been reviewing the assessment tool with us, has made suggestions about um, things that we could add um, and we'll be sending it back to them for further review so that we hope to be able to have the assessment tool go out to the departments on November 1st. Um, uh, uh, ben and Philip and I were part of um, an interview team to look at additional uh, applicants to join the HRC. So that um, those interviews I think went well and Hopefully we will have some additional people to join the commission from that. Um, uh, Jen and I were able to meet with Dr. Sheila Lord. She is the vice president of diversity, justice and belonging at Hampshire uh, College. Um, so she's very interested in the work of this commission as well as the other boards on town and is looking for ways to uh, connect the students in Hampshire with um, initiatives that we have in, uh, you know, in town. So that was a nice meeting and we hope to be able to meet with her again and also connect her to um, other resources in town. Um, so most of us, well, I guess, yeah, most of us on this call were able to attend the Latinx Heritage um, event on Saturday. And that I think went 
very well. It was a very good turnout. We had a beautiful day. The weather was really perfect and um, great entertainment and great food. So, um, you know, as with every event, there are some lessons that we <laughs> learned. But for the most part, I think things went really pretty much um, very well. And we very should feel that it was a very successful event. Um, along the lines of cultural events, and Jen may mention this again later, um, one of the town councilors and others in the community are sponsoring a Southeast Asian um, day on, I believe it's November 5th. And um, there's more information to come about that. So I think that that's the gist of things for the DEI update. Um, as for the retreat, uh, you, I had sent out to the group sort of the summary of the retreat. I, I think that that was time well spent, um, that we were able to really think, uh, um, spend some time sort of gelling as a group, having uh, an opportunity to get to know each other on a more personal level. Um, and also that it was a great opportunity for us to think about how the uh, Human Rights Commission can continue to grow and develop. So we did set some short-term goals, long-term goals, and discussed a legacy project. Um, the short-term goal is really just, well, I shouldn't say just because I think this would be a major accomplishment. The short-term goal is for the Human Rights Commission to um, complete the review of its bylaws, uh, make some changes around procedure, and have that approved by town council by the end of this fiscal, fiscal year. Um, so I think we have a very good start on that. There are some things that I'll need to follow up on based on our conversation with, um, at the retreat, but it, that was time well spent. I think uh, I'd love for the um, commission to in, invite one of the town councilors to perhaps the next meeting or an upcoming meeting. I've had several people reach out to me about uh, different projects in the town that would sort of mirror what we discuss about the legacy uh, le as a legacy project. So the legacy project that we discussed was an international movement call Welcoming um, America. It has obviously different names at different parts of the globe, but basically communities commit themselves to being welcoming uh, to individuals in the community on a, a variety of different uh, platforms. So in the California and uh, the Southwest, a lot of the communities are based around immigration, um, refugees, and those types of issues that could be Part of the platform, but it can, it can be expansive and include uh, lots of other issues. Uh, what I proposed was that uh, as a commission, we might think about that as a legacy project and take some time to really develop um, what we would want the welcoming part of that title to mean for the town of Amherst. And um, that would be a project that would hopefully grow in time. And I'm thinking, my thought was that in many communities, they have a welcoming week. So there's a week long series of various events. So sort of a know your rights event, like the one that uh, the students and Sunset created, as well as events specifically to immigrant populations or refugee populations, as well as other types of human rights issues. So it could be housing, uh, could be food insecurity. And then anyway, so a series of events throughout the week and then a one major event. And so my suggestion was to have the welcome in week sort of culminate with the block party that the town does because um, there's already a big sort of celebration in town that's planned. And so the, the, the days before there might be a series of events that the HRC would sponsor. Um, since then, I have re uh, received from uh, an email from one town councilor who um, had looked into 
a similar program that's um, that's titled, I think it's titled Compassionate Cities. So again, sort of a national international program that looks uh, around issues um, and holding events around compassion and kindness and what does it take to be a good neighbor, a kind neighbor, to in, how do you engage with people in the community? And so it's, uh, it, it, you know, it may be that we might be able to borrow from both of those types of programs to develop something that is more specifically uh, designed to meet the needs of the town of Amherst. So um, overall, I think I felt like the retreat went um, very well and I, you know, others obviously can speak to that. Um, so um, I think that those were the key issues that I wanted to present on those issues. Uh, I'll, I'll turn now to the addendum to the police report. Um, so uh, I, I don't know uh, if all of you or any of you were able to be in the audience on Monday, but there had been an, uh, an agreement between town council and the CSJC that the a town council would invite the CSJC back to a town council meeting and the meeting um, was supposed to be limited to one hour so that they could address some specific issues. Um, the uh, uh, town council president invited uh, Chief Livingstone and myself to be back to pre present additional information that we had obtained from since the August 15th meeting that occurred. And so both the chief and I gave um, remarks and had already submitted uh, written uh, reports that were included in the town council packet. Um, the addendum that I attached was based on information that I received from the police department, uh, the anonymous letters that had come in um, to both this body and to the CSJC, and then um, a letter from one parent uh, that uh, uh, sort of uh, stated uh, that parents' objections or viewpoints to the actions that are occurred on July 5th. I, um, it, by coincidence, Chief Livingstone and I both chose not to read our reports. Um, um, I had decided earlier that I felt like it was more important for me to just highlight the key points that I felt were important to address. Uh, which were to speak to really my inability to do some of the things that I think people thought that uh, I as a DEI director might be able to do in this situation. So, you know, the, uh, the police department, uh, both officers and supervisors are um, governed by a collective bargaining agreement. That agreement predates me and predates the creation of this position. Um, and I don't really have the authority to investigate, discipline uh, the department or any officers in the department. And so, you know, start with that limitation. But um, having said that, I, I felt like this role could be a role and has tried to be a role to sort of uh, provide some advice and influence to what is happening in the police department, but they are independent and I can't, you know, dictate or speak for the chief or direct what, um, what they do. Um, the other key points that I felt were important to bring out was that um, all of the families have been contacted by the police department. Um, many chose not to have any interaction, any interaction with the police department, only and this is reported from the police department because I don't have the identity of any of the individuals. Like I don't know them by name or who they are. All of that information is protected, um, but reported from the police department that uh, one family felt that they had, I guess, no objections or uh, didn't disapprove of what occurred. Um, we know at least, um, one letter came in to me that did challenge the way in which the 
actions of the police have been reported. And those were presented in a side-by-side -side table with sort of a summary of the objections of the, of the family and a, um, what I received from information from the police as a response. Um, and then I, I, I spoke very personally about how I am feeling about the situation because, um, and I hadn't done that before, but I, at this point in time, uh, I felt like it was really necessary for me to say that, you know, I take my job very seriously, um, that these issues are personal to me, um, that they're emotional and that it is ongoing work. Um, I don't have an expectation that things will be done um, to correct, uh, you know, bad feelings, hardships, uh, mistakes overnight. Uh, but I have done my best to do my job with integrity. Um, and with that, I mean, you have the reports, so you, you have them. I'm happy to answer any questions about my role um, to date, um, how I reached the uh, conclusions that I made, um, any questions that you might have. Feel free to raise a hand and jump right in. I don't want to bar anyone from feeling like they, anyone can speak right now. This will be a... I don't have much, I guess, to speak on. I think a lot of what I said on Monday and um, the CSSJC meeting, Pamela, but I did have a clarifying question on your report where it's a summary of disputed facts. Are those from the family member or the individual that you spoke to that those are their words or are those your words in there? So there, um, so in both of those charts, they are summaries of the information. So none of the, none of those things are verbatim, but um, that was a question that was also asked on Monday. And I did vet my summary with the family that I spoke to. So the family uh, uh, that I spoke to agreed that I could summarize or, or knew that I was gonna summarize the contents in that way. So they... Okay, I just, yeah, I guess that's just clarifying yeah. for me because Lynn, when I like read like the language discrimination occurred either of the police officers or neither of the police officers spoke on the scene. So that's like the family member then stating that and then the police officer's response. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And I, I would say for me, there's the, uh, the section that says late language discrimination occurred because neither of the officers on the scene spoke Spanish and the response is that one of the officers communicated with the parent that spoke Spanish. The officer did not perceive a language barrier. Did the parent perceive a language barrier? No, so, you know, I don't know if the parent, um, oh, so I would say I th the parent who reported that to me, I think they, their, that parent's answer would be yes, but I did not speak with the parent with whom the officer spoke. So yeah. the, the parent that spoke with me spoke English. Yeah. Exactly, because I was going to say, like, I mean, technically speaking, I mean, two people could speak English and still have a very language, right? Language. Yeah. So like, if, yeah. If, if I'm speaking legalese with someone who does not necessarily understand. So, yeah. It's, and um, not to put anyone on the spot, but uh, we have a couple folks from the same generation as these folks. I don't want an old man talk this, right? Like, I don't want to bring my baggage. You also don't necessarily have to talk. Yeah, you can go ahead, Vic. Um, I've already explained, you know, to this commission kind of what I've gone through in the past with the cops. Um, so already, just starting off with that, I've never really held that kind of sweet hand for them or like held those types of ex expectations when it comes to it. I don't think I've ever 
been impressed when it comes to how the police handles a bunch of things. So when it comes down to this, um, my application to the Human Rights Commission was speaking about what I wanted to do, the change I wanted to create as a youth. So when I see this, it kind of just bars what I try to do in my community, what I tried to do coming to this commission. And I don't want to like, I'm trying to put this in like the most um, <laughs> professional manner, but um, I, I I just honestly am outraged with the action, how long it's been, how there's almost kind of just really nothing done to me. It, it, it kind of just breaks um, my morals to what I stand on, why I I, I, I like, I, I like speak out for the things that I am passionate about. And when it comes to this, I just feel ashamed. I'm embarrassed of the town when we say that the police are supposed to protect us. I don't think I hear anyone saying in my school that the police are someone that they can count on. I think it's the complete opposite now. And I don't really blame anybody. And it, it it's, it's just something that I've, I've, gotten used to since July but it's also been something I've kind of lived with so to me it's it's this feeling of of not being or being disappointed it, it, it's not new but it also is is something that I feel like shouldn't come from this town because of our reputation of being so outspoken to help people that aren't represented it, it, it kind of just deters our our movements as a town. So I think the only thing that I can say in response to that is that, you know, my, uh, what I am able to do in my role is very limited, right? It just doesn't exist. And um, I think the one thing that I would say that I wish the chief had said on Monday is that uh, progressive discipline has been followed. So he did say that the town, or I don't know if he said it, but it's in his report, and I think also in mind that all of the post requirements have been met by the town as, um, and post is the new peace officers safety training. So it's basically state legislation, which requires that all municipalities train their officers in the same way. Um, if there are, uh, there are three categories where towns and municipalities are required to submit information where there is a serious bodily harm, where there's a death, where there are allegations of discrimination to the post commission. And the municipalities have an obligation to submit the information and any individual in the, uh, in, you know, in the municipality in the town could also submit. So anyone could submit in, um, information to post. So while he didn't say it, uh, I do know that, um, that the post commission regulations have been adhered to and that progressive discipline has occurred. Now, as we, I think discussed, I don't, at a prior HRC me meeting, um, you know, it's, it is typical in personnel matters that you do not disclose what the actual decision of the matter is. So, you know, employers do not typically t publicly announce what they are, you know, what decisions they've made around personnel matters. And there are some employers, I would say private employers primarily who, who do not follow that rule. So um, certainly in the summer after the death of George Floyd, where there were very public incidents where people were engaged in actions or behaviors that other individuals uh, perceived to be racist, private employers fired their employees. So the um, woman who interacted with the gentleman in Central Park who was uh, trying to do, he was there to, you know, do birding and watch the um, bird watching. Uh, individuals who worked at Starbucks who, you know, who, asked um, individuals 
uh, I think it was three guys who were meeting there for a meeting and to have and to have coffee to leave. Like so, private employers will quite often public, you know, sort of dismiss someone or terminate someone, and that information would be made public. But in state and municipal governments where there are union contracts and other and, and private employers where there are union contracts, it's just very seldom done. And, you know, um, it doesn't make it any easier. Uh, you know, I think it's the not knowing that bothers people the most, right? If they if they knew, they would there would be some sense that they might feel like something is done, but the not knowing is, is difficult, but um, there's, I don't know of a way ar around that. Yeah, I, I mean, I can definitely attest to that. Like in my day job, I, I would probably lose my day job if I like divulged what progressive discipline, what actions we took to discipline someone, so definitely get that like that I, I guess the, the the only part of the response that we can kind of really speak to is is like the, the bullet points here like the, uh, the de-escalation instructor course yeah so i know that um following this incident uh umass amherst was the host of a de-escalation training that was done i i think um, was funded by the Department of Justice and offered to like, um, you know, municipal police departments throughout Western Math throughout the state. So there were hundreds of people who participated. Um, and, um, and I know that the, that the Amherst Police Department did send two officers, that officers they sent their two tactical officers, the individuals who would be responsible for providing training to the rest of the department on those issues. Uh, is there any sense that like, is this a new thing? Do they, did they so break I, a boundary I, by, by learning how to de-escalate? So I don't, um, I don't think it's a new thing. Um, I, I think in the police uh, report, he actually, Chief Livingston states that there are officers who are trained in de-escalation, um, uh, who are part of the department and who teach the training at the, uh, at the police academy. Um, and, uh, and I know that he's aware that actually the post commission has posted, the post commission has posted, sorry for the pun, but has um, posted on their website uh, de-escalation tactics that are specifically uh, the design for youth. So I, I know that they're aware, aware of that, but I, I don't think that this is a first time occurrence. And we did learn on Monday that the officers who were involved are not, uh, you know, senior officers. They haven't been on the force for a, a, long, a long period of, of time. Um, they're fairly young. Um, okay. I was going to say that was my assessment from the videos that we weren't mm -hmm. looking at seasoned officers. One one thing that I, I I definitely wanted to speak to is the the very tail end of this of your report, the observations. Like, that, I I think this is a great synopsis or summary. But like that last sentence, mm -hmm. I I just wanted like blend my appreciation for that, like pointing out that like as a community we must have the courage. I think it's important to say that to admit a mistake, like it absolutely takes courage. I I, I don't know that I, I don't I don't know that I've I've necessarily witnessed what I would consider courageousness on the the force themselves, but but the, but pointing out to you know the corrective side of this, I I think that's really important. And then then also like I I do also this is hard for me, but the the very last part of that the Having the part about having the capacity to forgive and show grace, I, I think that's probably one of the toughest things to do, especially when you're, you're talking about having to forgive and show grace to folks that are in a position of power and authority. I, I think for me, I know that's that's very difficult. I don't yeah. want to speak for anybody else. So, uh, you know, I um, I was actually sort of advised um, 
to exclude that, but I felt like it was really important to say um, there are, I mean, I, you know, I bring my whole self to the, to the job. And so the, you know, I was trained as an attorney and sort of eased my way into DEI work. And I did that the, after I attended a, um, a work um, mission retreat in South Carolina in the 90s. So there were a rash of church burnings, arsons in the South, and um, uh, they were suspected to be racially motivated, although I don't think they ever um, um, they ever caught the arsonist or the person was ever convicted for the crimes. Uh, the uh, Council of Churches in Springfield at that time, I was a member of the Christ Church Cathedral, which is an Episcopal church in downtown Springfield. The Council of Churches in Springfield decided that they would adopt a church and that they would go um, down to help in the rebuilding. And so over a period of like, I don't know, I'm going to say like a three month period, teams of uh, 10 to 20 individuals from the Springfield community went down to Barnwell, South Carolina. And I really, I'll get emotional talking about this. Um, I consider it my epiphany moment because uh, part of the work was to have conversations about race and reconciliation. Uh, the group that went down from Western Mass was um, very diverse. There were members from the UU church. There was me from the cathedral. There were members from a Baptist church in Springfield. There was a couple from the synagogue in the Northampton area. Um, there were um, there were individuals who um, would probably, I think I could comfortably say would identify as LGBTQ and who had no um, religious affiliation whatsoever, but they felt like this call to participate. Part of the program was to have questions about race and reconciliation. And the, the week that our team was down there, there was no facilitator. And so I volunteered. I thought, you know, I'm trained as a lawyer. I've done mediation. I, I, can, I can sort of do this because I felt like the conversations were too important for them not to occur. It was probably the hardest thing I've ever done. It was certainly the dumbest thing that I'd done because I didn't really have any training in facilitating conversations about race, but um, I just made a commitment to sort of figure it out and do it. And I made a promise to myself um, after that, that I would not shy away from these conversations. I personally um, enter them with the lens of my faith. So I am really called to have that grace and forgiveness and mercy as part of as part of the process of who I, you know, of who I bring to the table. I know that that's not the lens that everyone brings, but for me, it's 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 critical. I I do not believe I can live in to my faith values if I'm holding hate or animosity or acting in a way um, that's not Christ-like. That's that's just I bringing my my whole self to, to the table. Um, and it has always been a struggle to have these conversations, right? They're very hard conversations to have and they're very emotional conversations to have. And I try to enter the space thinking that, um, that people are gonna try to bring their best selves. So that's not always the case, right? Cause some people don't really feel that way, but that's how I how I enter um, I enter the space, and I will say one other thing that I think it's important for me to say, which is that you know my role is to be the DEI director for the ent entire town, right? I, I, it, it's not appropriate for me to necessarily take sides. I am trying to be fair and neutral and take this middle of the road path to advance the entire community. Um, so, yeah, thank you for that, Pamela. That was very well. Um, Liz or Juliana, do you have anything to add? 
I think that um, to be in a position of power in any situation requires a level of trust because you do have that position over people in general. And I just think that the response or lack thereof following the days after the July 5th incident was kind of disheartening because it's it's kind of, I mean, of course, you have to retain this awareness that not everyone is going to be the same person as you and not have the same views of how you should react in any sort of situation. But it was kind of like a, a slap to the face to see that someone who is holding this power above these probably very scared kids is, you know, just not helping the situation and is operating off the assumption that they can just say what they want and essentially get away with it. And Pamela, I really appreciated the whole bringing your whole self to the conversation because nothing should be left out to be made palatable to other people. And um, I just think that everyone benefits from the different lenses that everyone brings. Thank you. I think the, the one last thing that I'll say, and this didn't get said on Monday because the conversation got um, cut short, but there had been, and I think there still is a plan for um, those of us in town hall to do um, what I would say, like a, a case study debrief to figure out what went wrong, how we could do things differently, you know, sort of a lessons learned um, approach. And that is, um, that's still a part of the plan. And, you know, some of the things have been discussed um, and have been noted, but there is a real plan to, to, to complete that work in a more concrete sense. That's great to hear. Liz, did you have anything else? For, well, for those of you who have been on our, in our meetings since this incident know exactly how I'm feeling about the situation. I never wanted there to be um, not necessarily discipline, however, training, because one of the things that I requested is that this maybe person goes to, um, you know, with the crest trainings and things like that. Um, I acknowledge that we can't because of the protection of his union, which I believe um, know everything that has been said or done when it comes to these two individuals and their interaction with those students. Um, I would have liked to have a, a response to our complaint and I'm assuming that that has come. Um, I was not privy to, I was in the meeting up until 7.30 because I had a class to go to. And so I did not catch all of what happened and I'm disappointed to find out that members of our community were cut off, shut down, put out, stilled, when they were reacting in their true selves. Um, but as far as the incident in itself, I take very seriously um, our young people um, and protecting our young people. Um, I grew up in a time when there, were racial, when there was serious racial divide. I lived in Cambridge when the incident of busing in Boston came to light and it spilled over into my high school. Um, and I never want to see a witness to racial divide, even though it's here, there, and everywhere. Um, I'm wondering what the response would have been like had the majority of those young people been uh, not BIPOC. And I just want somebody to realize that I never wanted this person fired or disciplined. I wanted this person trained. Um, so I pray that that's something that's ongoing, um, to know that 
um, the police department are doing de-escalation trainings is, is good. Um, we do them at the school with the staff. I was one of the trainers, so I know. Um, I had to go to extensive trainings outside in order to train internally. Um, I just am heartbroken that I'm looking at Victor's face on this screen and I'm looking at Juliana and they feel unsafe in their town. Um, and if I can continue to at least be bring to the forefront um, of these issues so that I don't look at them and see the, the distrust in their faces, then that's the job that I will continue to do. Thank you, Liz, for that. Um, I just wanna be respectful of your time, Pamela. And um, if any, no one has anything else to say, I just want to put out there in this meeting that the police report that came in um, was addressed to the Human Rights Commission. So that is our official um, address to the report. Uh, and I know that Chief Livingstone is not here and you cannot speak for him, but I am disheartened that the apology that we receive is just a regret from himself and the department as a whole, as opposed to the individual officers involved. I think taking that ownership would have been the step that this community is looking for, but that was not given. And then I just do wanna uplift your, um, your report, Pamela, and say that the observation part of it, I think speaks volumes to the work that you are doing. And I truly do appreciate that. And your statement of some of the youth and the family involved in the July 5th police interaction have expressed feeling harmed. No one is in a position to deny others feelings. And I think that we all need to take that in our steps for moving forward is that the individuals of this incident are, have expressed, are expressing that they have felt harm and no one can take that away from them. And with that, I think that I will leave that comment there. All right, well, um, I hope you guys in, um, are able to get through the rest of the meeting and uh, I will see you soon. Can, but can I just say one more thing before you leave, Pamela? I know that you reported on our um, last Saturday's event at Kendrick Park. Um, I just want everybody and uh, audience members to know um, Victor wasn't there because of a family emergency. He was actually um, not even in the state. But I wanted to acknowledge um, Philip and Victor's and Jen Jenny's, um, Jennifer's. Um, pulling that off, um, especially I want to say something about Victor and um, acknowledge his leadership there. And even though he wasn't there physically, he was still checking in um, from out from California at a family emergency. And um, so Victor, I just want to put on the record that we are acknowledging, I am acknowledging your contributions to that event. And um, so for everybody who's in the audience who didn't know that, this is our young people at their finest. We had a great time and I appreciate your efforts in making that happen. Yes, you should definitely be very proud of yourself because it did, was a great event, so. Thank you, I really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna leave. Thank you so much. One. Okay, so, so that pretty much wraps up section three, correct? We're all so one more. You had a report to me. Well, it doesn't wrap up section three. I think uh, what we just did was allow Pamela to speak because she needed to leave early. So we still have some items on section three that we need to discuss. But I think that, um, I don't know if we go to public comment and go back to the rest of their agenda here. That could be great, but I will speak on the members report. Um, Liz, you kind of alluded to what I was gonna to speak to. Um, Monday, the CSSJC joined the town council meeting and that was a, a time at that meeting. If you have a chance to go visit that, um, 
the majority BIPOC group was shut down by a town councilor, one individual that invoked an article in their bylaws that abruptly stopped conversation in the middle of a motion to hopefully move this situation forward as a town. And that was just not okay and everything about it. And I think I have talked a lot on this issue. So forgive me if I'm being very vague on this issue. I, I have, I think, spoken my tongue off on it, but that's what I have. So I will leave with that. Perfect. So unless there are any objections, I'm seeing we have a, a lot of folks here to talk. Um, we can go on to public comment and then wrap up anything that we haven't discussed after that. Is everybody in favor of that? I'm kind of chomping at the bit to hear from the public. So first I saw Vera, Vera Cage, I'm sorry. I forgot I should be formal about this yet. I see Vera Cage and then I, now I do not see Vera Cage. Yes, I do see Vera Cage again, but so we'll, we'll go in order of uh, Vera Cage, Dr. D. Shabazz, and then Pat on the back move, so. And then other Dr. Shabazz, Dr. Al Makar Shabazz. And I'm trying to stall here as I figure out how to allow someone to talk. Well, so I just tried to move Vera in and it it's not letting me move her in as a panelist. So, oh, it did is. she come in? Cause we just lost her if she didn't. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Good. All right. Oh, and I'll, let me read the blurb before we get into it. So during the public comment period, one of the co-chairs will recognize members of the public when called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name preferred pronouns and residential address. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes at the discretion of the co-chairs based upon the number of people who wish to speak. No speaker can cede their time to another speaker. The HRC will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during public comment. And so with that said, I will acknowledge Vera Cage. Welcome. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I just want to uh, uh, quickly also give uh, feedback about Mr. Earl Miller's presentation to the um, CSSJC when he presented. Um, he is looking to replace at that point a, a departure. So one person did leave their um, press position and um, so if at that point he was looking to, to uh, recruit, so um, FYI. Uh, and one of the questions from the CSSJC folks, I'm sorry, Philip, if, if I'm overstepping your report, um, but I thought it would be good to make sure um, that we know why people are leaving um, so that way, we can predict or make the accommodations um and that that the that that crest is is not handling noise complaints as people widely are are have believing um and also that it's not a 24 7 service um to the community um but i I think you know there needs to be a serious focus on an organizing model, and I think that is something that um, they are doing. Um, but I'd love for it to be very intentional. Um, I also heard that the school committee, um, uh, Ben Harrington, <laughs> um, today from someone who mentioned there may be some participatory action research happening on the ground with with the school community, and I would love to see a spillover. Um, to involve the whole family and community members, residents as well. I think that would be fantastic um, to figure out what are, what are incentives, um, stipends or whatever to um, get people to come together and to problem solve our community, the, the problems that we're facing in our community. Um, the officers that were involved in the Amherst 9 incident, um, they were not rookie officers, they were um, people who um, 
let's see. Um, you know, one of the officers graduated from Western Mass Regional Police Academy in April, 2019. You know, this person had a bachelor's degree in criminal justice with a minor in political science and history. Um, he was served as an officer in Ludlow before joining the police department. So he was an officer in 2017 for Ludlow. The other person, Carol, has been a member of the Amherst Police Department since 2017 after graduating from the Reading Regional Police Academy. Um, she graduated from UMass with a bachelor's degree in biology with a minor in sociology and a criminal justice certificate. Um, she completed her master's degree in public administration with a concentration in criminal justice at Westfield State University in December. Um, I want to state that the, um, also Scott Livingstone's comments at the uh, last town council meeting um, was a little bit alarming because essentially at the end of the day, he said he would do it again. He would detain the, the young people again and he would make sure that they could not move freely until they determined who and how they were going to move um, about, right? So if it doesn't, you know, and then there was an article by Scott Mertz back in the Gazette, and it, it talks about what happens in this particular video, but there was a whole hour of interaction. It doesn't take that long to figure out that these young people were not doing harm to anybody and that they should have been supported to freely you know, disperse or they, the police should have just left them alone to problem solve for themselves because I think they would have handled it, okay? Um, but it's this, this, this sentiment from Chief Livingstone himself that is, doesn't see the problem of, 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 of offering to, to have to take up, to take these young people to just get a slice of pizza and talk it over. That is just, you, this, it just tells me that this chief doesn't get it, okay? And it also reminds me of the institution of policing and the history of policing. How, yeah, okay, so you found young people. Okay, we're gonna take you into custody and we're gonna bring you back to where you belong because you do not belong, you, you do not have the ability or the freedom to move freely at night, especially. We will determine, even though there's no curfew, even though, you know, so, and then the police report, it mentions a parent's name, but it doesn't, you know, I'm glad Pamela, um, no one was able to speak to the fact that Mr. Stewart disputed what the police, you know, alleged occurred. And, and that wasn't clear in the police report that she, you know, um, wrote. Um, and I also wanna um, also, say that the DEI position, um, there's a lot that we don't hear from what Pamela is not reporting. And I wanted to tell her, you know, I hope she was on now, but you know, I, I got feedback from one of, you know, people of color or black people, or, you know, um, there's so few in town that to say, you know, somebody was an employee, had an issue, and then, you know, Pamela helped them would essentially just close their identity. But so I just wanted to appreciate her role behind the scenes of what she's not reporting to us about people really expressing to her, to her what is really going on and her being able to be responsive in the way that this particular person, you know, needed. And so I wanted to tell her that. But sometimes, you know, we all know what these white institutions will do to people. And yes, her role is very limited and it was it's intentional, it's explicit that she can't participate or that she they refuse to allow her to be in the collective bargaining table when the police union is negotiating the con their contract, their terms of their employment with the town. And I will push back on the on police officers are a special category of, of people. They're not just regular employees like you and I. You hear, oh, suspend it without pay. Um, you know, the, the Texas police officer, you know, that, that shot at the young man that was just eating a burger at the McDonald's parking lot, right? You, we all know what the discipline one um, was for that. So let's, we can go on and on. So we need to allow, make sure that we have a higher standard for our police force than what the state is, is requiring as their minimum. Um, and there, there's been articles out 
the Amherst Bulletin talks about the Gazette seeking public records request about complaints against officers and all they get are a lot of redacted documents. So it's not a lot of transparency coming from our police department. Um, and there's not in the internal investigation, we see the report, the police are not are, are incompetent, they're not able to police or, or to adequately provide the thorough investigation that we need. And I, I will push back, like the report lacks, it's not balanced. I don't think the DEI position should be that it serves the entire town or it, even the Crest program. We need to have more um, granular information and data. Like, okay, so Crest engaged with 40,000 people in six months or three months, but what are the deeper engagements you know, that are, that's happening. And we heard a tiny bit of that from, from Earl, you know, sometimes their engagements are four hours or six hours, but let's do like deeper engagements that are very focused, intentional, that yield results um, from our residents and, and our community members that really uplift people who are, you know, um, the least, you know, served by this town and most harmed by this town, by their practices. and. And um, so thank you. Um, I probably ran over my minutes. Um, I appreciate the young people involved in this committee. Um, you know, I am a, almost a 50 year old woman, a mom, and I grew up, you know, as an immigrant, right? As a refugee immigrant. And I will always be there for people that can't speak up for themselves or to not feel safe. And there are so many people in our community that suffering that have been harmed, adults and young people. And they do not have the ability, the tools or the safety to be able to freely speak against the police or other powers to be. So I appreciate all the time that you're giving in to this, the Amherst Nine, thank you. And thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Vera. Who did I say was next? Oh, we'll, we'll go to Dr. D. Shabazz next. I'm just trying to move everybody around. Just give me one second, please. Hello, thank you so much. Um, I just want to say uh, thank you to the HRC for filing the complaint. I, I really believe if not for your work, um, the community would not have gotten some of the responses that were submitted, of course, by DEI and um, by the police report this, this Monday. Um, wouldn't happen. So thank you. Thank you for being brave enough uh, to do that. And first off, as uh, a co-chair of the CSSJC, Allegra is the other co-chair, um, we are demanding a full report of the incident, a report that includes the statements from the youth and the families. And if you watch the town council meeting, even though it's abbreviated and we were uh, shut down, um, the um, there were quite a few questions from our committee regarding holes in that report. So I um, I ask that you know, uh, you all, uh, if you have time to look at that, I think it would be really helpful. We're also asking for an apology. Um, you know, it's not enough that the, again, they're disciplined and we, we don't know fully what that means as Vera Cage indicated, we need more details regarding that. Um, you know, an apology to the youth, 
and their families. These young people were not charged with anything, but they were detained unnecessarily and according to the DEI report and the police report erroneously. Um, and then lastly, we need a commitment from the town council um, towards a compensation fund. We feel that this will uh, go towards uh, not only helping these young people and their families in terms of healing and uh, feeling whole, but this will hopefully deter other police in the department from um, you know, beha behaving uh, inappropriately. Um, so lastly, this, this I feel is a real opportunity uh, to ask for accountability in our town on behalf of our youth to restore trust from those that are meant to protect us uh, and to figure out a process in our town to help heal these young people and their families and attempt to make them whole. After all, as uh, Victor and Juliana shared, it's, it's our responsibility as adults to hold and protect you as young people. We have several uh, community members interested in coming together to figure out a process and how to resolve this incident because it's not over. Um, we hope that this committee would be interested in working with the CSSJC and others to bring this town, I feel, into the 21st century where our BIPOC youth can grow and learn in a positive environment that respects who they are and hopefully will want to come back here to live and raise their children. So again, thank you, HRC. And um, I hope to support your work and I, I hope that we can work together with the CSSJC. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dean. Next would be Pat Anabaku. That was the order, right? Okay, I'm going off the cuff here. That's fine. I don't know. I'm trying to promote her to panelists, it's not. Allowing me to move her as panelists. Oh, maybe here she comes. Can people hear me now? Absolutely. Okay, I'm so sorry. No, no problem. Okay, good evening. First, I want to thank you all uh, for an excellent event on Saturday. It was a lot of fun, you know, music, food. Uh, thank you for your hard work. Um, so I just wanted to appreciate you all for that. Another thing I want to say, to say is that uh, in addition to what Vera said, I agree with everything she said and Dr. Shabazz, is that um, I think at this stage with that incident, nobody should be surprised. This happens all the time, except for this time, a kid was smart enough to be the tape. I think our next step is to think about protest. I think, you know, we have the momentum. Um, I would like to see HRC, CSSJC, um, the African Heritage Group, MS Sunrise, and other group, PCA, for us to organize a protest. Um, possibly as you know, one of the weekends, something for you guys to think about. And as for reconciliation or healing, honestly, history is repeating itself. I don't see us healing in this town as long as we have our current police chief. All you need to do is just 
go back time in history and see his record. This guy really doesn't care, has no compassion for what happened to our youth. He said it clearly that, you know, he's not stepping down, he's not going anywhere. I raised the similar alarm several years ago about the superintendent in our schools. And what happened when she left, she left with hefty money, tax dollars money before she left. And we have police chief that is dividing our community. I don't even know how we're going to move forward. One of my suggestions would be for CS. CSSJC, uh, Human Rights Commission, and the uh, reparation group to write a comprehensive report of July 5th to counter what Chief Livingstone put out on Monday. Because we need to get the voices of the, of the kids. Is, is missing in the report. So it's something we need to think about. This is history and we need to get it right since they have refused to do the right thing. I don't have any faith that we will ever heal in this town unless we dismantle white supremacy structures in our town. And I am so excited about HRC because you all are so courageous and speak true to the power and you don't get the recognition. Keep up the good work. I'm here to support you guys. I'm more like a behind the scene type of woman and I like action. People who know me know that I don't like too much talk like meeting, talk, talk, talk. That doesn't work for me. I like action. I appreciate all of you. Our young people, when I listen to Victor and Juliana, oh my goodness, our future generation. Thank you for volunteering in HRC. And uh, the struggle continues, but um, we have a lot of work to do and we should all you know, work together to make some progress. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Next, Dr. Amilcar Shabazz. On mute. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to speak. I am a member of a town uh, public body, uh, the African Heritage Reparations Assembly, but I wish to make it clear that I do not speak on behalf of that of that group, and uh, and I'm speaking now in my position as a uh, private uh, resident of Amherst. Um, but with with concern about uh, the reparative justice process that AHRA is involved in. Uh, and I wish to say two, two things quickly. Um, part of the basic um, principle uh, and, and modality of uh, reparative justice as we on the AHRA are, are beginning to understand it and, and trying to fashion a plan that, that implements it um, is Acknowledgement, apologies, truth telling is an essential part of any process of repair, of making amends, of atoning, let alone of healing. Uh, but uh, and so we do encourage all efforts being called upon, whether by this body or CSSJC, uh, to, uh, move, to, to kind of address this incident of July 5th with a mindset of, of, of uh, truth-telling, of full truth-telling and um, uh, uh, of, of acknowledgement and of apology. You know, the, I, I particularly 
am bothered by the way in which uh, the, the contracts entered into between so-called collective bargaining units with the town of Amherst as an employer becomes what is referenced as the obstacle to truth telling, the obstacle to uh, acknowledging and, uh, and, and perhaps even uh, of apologizing. Um, I don't know that that's entirely the reason that people are saying more. I, I think I'm hearing it from the DEI director, but, um, and, and I think I've heard some aspect of that coming from town manager. I think one night when the town council meeting uh, dissolved into uh, something really fatuous, the president, uh, Lynn Greismer of that body was starting to offer that, that rationale that, you know, the reason we can't do more around this is because of uh, collective bargaining agreements um, between the, the unit uh, representing these police officers uh, and, uh, and the town. And um, personally, I don't think you get anywhere I'm not sure about this whole idea of, well, the DEI director ought to be a part of that collective bargaining team when the next contract, I'm not sure about any of that. That I think we're, a lot of times people are saying things off the cuff without understanding what the process is or what the real problem is. I think the real problem here is that whether you've got to amend a charter or whatever you have to do that limits the ability of the, the contracts or the collective agreements we form from being used as a means to limit the kind of transparency, the kind of truth telling around uh, incidents that threaten our vulnerable population, our young people, our black and brown people, you know, all and, and so on. That if that really, if we're really trying to end structural racism, then to, you know, we've got to figure out, we're smart people here, we've got to figure out what do you need to revise in the by, as a bylaw, as a charter amendment, as a whatever, to limit the ability of any kind of collective bargaining process to keep us from knowing the truth when an incident involving the police occurs that negatively impacts uh, uh, members of the public, especially of the most vulnerable parts of our public, of, of our of our community. If we're trying, to, if we're serious about human rights, if we're serious about you know dismantling structural racism or anything else, if we're serious about community safety and human rights, then I think we've got to look bigger. We've got to look harder. And we've got to propose whatever. And, and you know, demonstrations, fine. Demonstrations come, demonstrations go. What are you demonstrating for is more importantly the, the question. And to me, an apology is just one part of a process. We need to find out what is the impediment to the apology. This happened July 5th, and we haven't been able to have satisfactory truth telling, satisfactory acknowledgement that something wrong occurred. And we haven't had satisfactory um, uh, 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 disclosure of, 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 of how this won't happen again, okay? So for me, I'm, I implore this body, um, you've, I, I salute what you've done. I salute that you raised the call for an investigation of abuse of, 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 of authority or however the exact language was that you put forward. Thank you for that. Um, you know, I think that the fact that we're still in a place, October now, where um, mid-October from something that happened July 5th, and we still don't feel a sense of satisfaction around these matters, points that we need more than a demonstration, we need more than an apology, we need more than, you know, a, a, a pizza. Okay, we need to figure out what is the real impediment to the justice we're seeking, to justice, and then what are the structural ways we need to reform Amherst 
to accomplish that safety, to accomplish that system of, of, of safety that we're looking for. And like I said, we've got bright minds here. Why can't we do this? Why aren't we calling out that? Final thing I wanna say is with respect to this idea of some type of fun uh, in terms of some type of compensatory framework that when a wrong has occurred of our sworn officers, of people in authority to protect us and something goes amiss, that there might be a fun. You know, those young people have we've been saying detained for an hour of their life in a very precarious situation as it's always precarious with a, a sworn officer with a gun and with the power to kill, it's always precarious that a, a d d detention for an hour like that, what is that worth? We have to be able to ask that. Okay, we can't just be out and say hollering for a fund, a victim's compensation fund, and we're not able to ask how do we val value what a harm is? This isn't rocket science, it's done every day. And so if we're talking about this hour of detention under a very precarious circumstance that we judge as having been wrong, or, or at least in part initiated on a wrongful basis, that you know someone could come out of their mouth and say, you have no rights, okay? That under those, that an hour in detention uh, under that kind of precarious uh, context, what is it worth? And then let's monetize it. And then from at least my standpoint, I will certainly bring up, would be happy to bring up within AHRA, how to uh, discuss a process by which out of these funds. My only concern is, is that this particular fund is set up around people of African descent, okay? And uh, I know there were members of the Amherst Nine who do not identify uh, on some part or some level as a person of African descent. So in that case, I don't know by our own guidelines, by our own charge and mission, whether the fund that we are generating and the fund that we rec could recommend expenditure from would, would be possible for those uh, who do not uh, uh, in whole or in part identify as African-American, as a person of African descent. So that's the one thing I sense we'd have to have some debate, some discussion on with respect to the, the process that we're in. But other than that, I'd be happy to um, to explore um, the, the the broad idea of uh, of compensatory of how uh, under the injury area of criminal punishment how when incidences occur that continue the the process or or are part of this very process of harm that we're trying to end that there is a compensatory, there is the possibility of recommending compensatory payments from the funds that, that, that we within the AHRA are a part of, uh, of planning for. So those are my comments, take them for what you will, and I appreciate all you're doing. Peace. Thank you very much. And um, you guys wanna point out, I read the little disclaimer, so I, I'll apologize to anyone who, sarcastically, to anyone who took umbrage with the fact that we did not limit comments to three minutes. I, I, I think there are certain subjects that are important enough not to be relegated to time limits. And so. Before we end public comment, um, does anybody else have anything else to say in the public? You just go ahead and raise your hand and we'll acknowledge you. All right. So here are we at four. Are we moving to upcoming events yet or is there, there were still some things do you want to do HR member reports now? Yeah. Yep. 
R E H R C. Is do we is that Liz? Yeah, housing. Well, the HRC member reports is if just someone has something to report on. Liz is under uh, a is under the action and discussion items yep. for the housing authority or housing affordable housing trust. Yeah. Did we have any member reports? Anyone have anything they wanted to talk about? <laughs> Fair, so we can move on to, we can finish up the uh, section three action and discussion items then. So we already did the uh, treaty. Yeah, I just wanna, uh, we did A and B and so I'll go on to C and I think it has been spoken um, about the event. I think that it was a very good event, very well attended event. Performers were very, um, I was going to say performative. It is late in the night, if that's the only word that I could come up with for performers. They were very great performers. Um, and I think that it was a great first event. And I look forward to next year putting it together again and having that happen. Um, if anybody else that was there at the event wants to speak to that. I already did. So thank you. I just want to say that uh, many members of our community reached out to me saying that um, they felt that they were finally being acknowledged as a community, that they got this whole celebration dedicated to them, and that it was more than just, uh, you know, it's Latinx Heritage Month, and this is what it means, like an actual celebration, an actual opportunity for people to come together and you know, talk about themselves, talk about where they came from, but also be able to, you know, either come into this new community wherever they came from or be a, feel included in a place where they didn't feel before. And even though I'm completely sad and I wasn't able to attend, it meant so much more hearing from the people that actually went, for the people that we made this for, to feel like it was worth it and that they hope that this is an ongoing event, but we also open it up to more communities and more people that haven't been represented or haven't been acknowledged like this in the future. I just wanted to bring that up to everyone. Thank you for bringing that up, Victor. That's very great to hear. I'm glad that people reached out to you about that. It's very exciting. If no one has anything else for action item and discussion C, we can move on to D which is updates, area updates, I believe. Uh, DEI update is already done, press is done. AHRA was done as well. Um, AHTF, the Housing Authority, I cannot remember that acronym, sorry. And the Amherst Housing Trust Fund. Oh, wait, Amherst Affordable Housing Trust Fund. There's too many acronyms here in the town. Liz? <laughs> I know. So I, again, I wasn't able to go to the meeting, but I did um, was a, a listening ear when the town council was talking about affordable housing and um, you know what constitutes and people um, that are not um, immediate family being you know the the number of people that can be um, unrelated in a single dwelling and all of this and. I just, it's just dis still disheartening that we do not have um, enough affordable housing for um, those of us who um, were born here, raised here, still work here, that they cannot afford to live here in their own community and that we continue to, um, have a discussion around those who come in for a little while, do not have an investment in the town and then leave after they graduate and don't come and give back. So um, I'm gonna continue to be a listening ear and talk about it whenever I can. I will be attending 
our district two uh, meeting, which is next Wednesday um, with Lynn Greshmeyer. And um, I will be harping on it again. And I'm not sure if this is a place to say this, that um, I have recently joined with Ben um, School Equity. Um, I don't know what our acronym spans. I used to say task force, but it's not task force anymore. And we are also having a retreat um, next Wednesday um, to talk about some of our next steps in supporting everyone in the schools with an eye on some of us actually spending time within the buildings to talk to the kids and staff and find out what their pulses are like and try to um, move from there and making sure everybody is being looked after, if that's a good phrase to say. Perfect. And the, the acronym is School Equity Advisory Committee now. I, I still call it SETF all the time, mistakenly. Oh, are we okay? So that wraps up the. Are we on to membership quorum? Yep. I think uh, Pamela kind of alluded to that with uh, us meeting potential new members. So we met potential new members um, on Monday, and Paul Bachman, the town manager, is um, moving those names to the town council to vote on. So we are hoping by our next meeting. We may have two more members, which would be great. And um, yeah, that'd be awesome. So I think that's all we have on that, unless anybody else has anything to say on that. Um, just for Juliana and Victor, um, please be mindful of some of the underclassmen in our school. Um, the two of you are seniors and we're not sure what your plans are for next year. So if you're not going to be around and you're going to have to take a step off of the committee, we're hoping that you can help us recognize some young people that can, um, I don't want to say take your place because nobody can take your place, but um, fill in the void that you two will leave. So, um, and let us know, especially me, because I can, you know, come in, help you talk to people, pull cool meeting or sports teams or whatever it is that um, um, Latinos, Unidos, whatever other things that you're dealing with, women's rights, whoever it is, so that we can try to find a, a young, young people to fill the void when you all go off to further your, your minds where, wherever that is. Yeah, me and Victor have talked to a couple people um, we've mentioned it to Poku, People of Color United, the club that we're both part of. Um, and honestly, there's kind of been some interest, but we'll, we'll keep it up. Thank you, that's I, great. I, I know, I know y'all got it. I know you got it. That's great. And thank you for bringing that up, Liz. Before we move on to upcoming um, events, I just like to make a motion. And it's in regard to kind of what we heard from the public and as well as, well as email that I have received. I like the HRC to motion and I'm looking for a second on it to have our two co-chairs, me being one of them and Ben Carrington being the other, to reach out to the CSSJC and the AHRA to find a time to meet and potentially either come up with the truth telling report as a member from the audience has said, but to have us meet, even though a motion on the town council was denied to invite for a meeting. So I'm looking for a second on that. Second. All right, then I will call on for a vote. So I will just go on the order of my screen. Juliana? Yeah. Victor? Yes. Ben? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Liz? Yes. And I am a yes as well. So, Ben, uh, 
let's send out that email as soon as possible and I'll reach out to you for that. Perfect. So just for future references, once someone seconds, you need to open up for discussion, even if there's no discussion. Fair enough, thank you. All right. So upcoming events, upcoming heritage and cultural celebrations. Are we are we hoisting that on Jennifer as usual? <laughs> <laughs> So um, I, first, I want to talk about the upcoming proclamations. So Human Rights Day is December 10th, which is usually a very small but very nice celebration where we read the uh, Human Rights Declaration. Uh, so um, that proclamation needs to be updated. And so I didn't know if folks on this committee know of anybody who would like to be involved in recreating or revising the current proclamation, which I sent in an attachment, it should be in your packet um, for Human Rights Day. Um, if not, it will move forward to, it has to go to GOL first. So we do need to kind of get it done quickly because it has to go to GOL and looking at the town council schedule. Oh, I don't have anything listed on there after October. So uh, my guess is they probably have one to two meetings in November and one to two in December, but the Human Rights Day is December 10th. So, um, you know, it might just be easier if we just, pro you know, if you guys look at it and if you have quick revisions to hand it back over. The um, GOL, governance organization and legislation will ask for a representative from the Human Rights Commission to attend the meeting and as a sponsor. Or I can just say that the entire HRC is sponsoring the proclamation as is. But it's always good if somebody can attend one of their meetings. Um, the, Do we know the date for that mm -hmm. meeting, Jen? Or no? I don't now. I don't okay. now. But once I send, like, if... Um, If you guys can get any revisions to me by the end of next Friday, which would be the 28th, then I can forward it onto GOL and then they'll take it from there. Um, and just because we have holiday crunch times and, and, and several celebrations at once, if we can work on the Dr. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, proclamation, the Black History Month proclamation, and the Lunar New Year or Spring Festival proclamation. So it's those three proclamations. Um, if you guys know folks in the community who would like to work on those, I know last year we had um, students from the middle school attend the and help celebrate the Spring Festival as along with one of the pastors from the Chinese um, ministries at First Baptist. So they had a lot of input and were involved in the celebration itself that we had. And hopefully this year we can do all of these live in person and not via Zoom. Well, that all sounds great. I think let's all, um, as Jen said, if we can get the revisions in for the Human Rights State Proclamation, next Friday the 28th and then depending on the date of that meeting I will let you know if I can attend or not Jen but I just need to know that mm -hmm. and then yeah we can all start looking at the upcoming proclamations as well that'd be great so that way yeah. we're not too time sensitive on them and then having uh reaching out to community members would be you know who want who would want to be involved so for aapi heritage month i had um some of the folks from umass come and and speak so um outside of the proclamations for november we've got national native american american indian and alaska native heritage month i thought that gol was trying to work on a proclamation and i don't know where they are with that or an event um it's uh, it, I think it might be a little bit hard for us to pull that together at this point, but it's definitely something that we need to look more into for the following year. 
Um, November 2nd is Equal Pay Day, November 9th, World Freedom Day, November 13th, World Kindness Day, November 16th, International Day of Tolerance, the 17th is International Students Day, and the 20th is Transgender Day of Remembrance. So as usual, it would be great if we could have some Facebook posts to put out. We did get a lot of responses from what we did put out um, the last few times. So if each of you guys would like to, um, you know, choose one of them and, and write, a, you know, one or two sentences. And if you can include a photo, that would be great. If not, I can find one. That would be good. Um, and then we also have them for December. We have World's AIDS Day. I think that would be a great one. International Day for the Abolition of Slavery, International Day for People with Disabilities. That's an, another good one. Um, you know, the Human Rights Commission works really hard on all ableisms, but we don't really discuss disability too much here. And so I think that's something that we should definitely highlight a little bit more. Of course, we have Universal Human Rights Day, International Human Solidarity Day. And then December 26th through January 1st is Kwanzaa which is something that we've been doing too. So I believe that both the doctors, Shabazz's are here. I don't really ever know. Mr. and Mrs. Dr. Shabazz are here. Um, and so, and, you know, what the Human Rights Commission would like to do, maybe collaborate for Kwanzaa or, and or with other community members. We've had some great Kwanzaa celebrations thus far. And I think this will be our third year of celebrating Kwanzaa. Are we planning to do this via Zoom again? No more. I wouldn't. I. I. Unless we, you know, our numbers go up really high, I would hope that we can do all of our events in person. Yeah, I was. I was not jazzed about how that kicked off <laughs> last year at all. So if we could prevent that. Double I don't necessarily remember that it. Well, um, okay. It was a well, drive that happened. We got bombed. Oh, that's right. Yep, yeah, we did. Yep. No, and um, that that tends, yeah. So, but we have better ways to prevent that if we do have to go via Zoom. Um, so that's where we are at. Does anybody else have any other heritage months or celebrations that weren't included? Just between now and December. I don't. I don't see any, but are missing but yeah i think we're good um yeah let's let's try and rather than email it out if everybody could possibly choose something for the month of november that'd be great so that way we kind of know whose onus is on that date so we and have just, equal, mm -hmm. uh, so we have equal pay day which is november 2nd we want to take that on um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if I'm remembering right, but I think a while ago I wrote something for the International Day of Tolerance. Um, but I can also take something on as well, like any one of these. Liz, were you going to say something? Um, I was just going to say that I would take that one on. All right. Equal pay. And that's Go. November 2nd. November 2nd, that's correct. Well, I have to get it to Jen by the week before, just in case she needs to edit anything. That's what I keep in my brain anyway. <laughs> no, that's, that's fair. World Fe Freedom Day. Can I do that one? Yep. All right, that is November 9th. World Kindness Day. I can do that one. Awesome. And it sounds like, Juliana, you already did the November 16th International Day of Tolerance. So then we'll move to November 17th International Student Day. Might be a good one for you, Ben. Yeah, I was, I was going to say that's like a. Actually, the last two are like easy for me. If if anyone has no objections, I, I can do the. Hey, if I don't have to take one on, I will not object. You can take them on if you would like to. <laughs> well, I was just thinking I would lean on you for assistance. I'm just like, yeah, that's that's fine. Yeah. So, um, 
not only that, but we still have December. So Phil, we can like Philip, we can just give you three or four. <laughs> just give me all of them there. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right in here. He said, and, like, oh, you know what though? Them. I will um well, I guess I've got to get that into you soon. So I don't know, want to commit, but for uh national native American, do we want to post about that? I think that we can at minimum post something on Facebook as an acknowledgement. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll collab with you on that or send you over something, Jen. And we're not limited to a sentence or two, right? Like it, it could be like a paragraph or two. Mm -hmm. So, you know, two, two, three sentences minimum, right? Oh, perfect, perfect. Anything else after that is fantastic. <laughs> Great. All right. And then also just, everybody if you could take a look at the proclamation i believe jen you attached that right on um, for the human rights so there or, should be links to all of the proclamations that are that they're actually pdfs but they're links to the ones that have were approved by the council last year mm -hmm. yeah. sounds good so yeah if everybody could take a look at that before the 28th Got the events going. I don't know what I just pulled up on my computer. Sorry, forgive me. Ben, can you see where we are on the agenda? Yep, we're at the next meeting date. Fun part. That's whatever the third Wednesday is, right? <laughs> Let me see. Oh, but the third Wednesday in November, isn't that the date? Oh, no, it's the 16th. No, oh, yeah, it is. Everybody good for the 16th at 6.30? I'm good on my end. That would be yes for me. I believe I can make it work. But... Juliana, you are trying to say, or you're saying, hold on, got it. You're looking up. <laughs> that works for me. I think that works for me too. I'm good. Sounds good. Perfect. And then uh, other topics, not, what do we word it? Yep. Other topics that the chair did not reasonably anticipate 40 hours in advance of the meeting. Go once, go twice. And then we can. Make someone can make a motion to adjourn if they would like to, or we could just stay on the rest of the evening. <laughs> Actually, I had a comment. I completely forgot I wrote it down. Um, I don't know if uh, we remember. Uh, I don't. I think it was the the last meeting right before our retreat. A public comment was made about um one of the amherst residents that was a part of a hate crime and i i don't remember if we said we were going to do something or if we we're going to like reach out i was just kind of bringing it up because i know um many people that are family with the victim um his name is franklin rosa he they they reached out to me and they said either if we could just if, if there's anything that we could do, if we could, they're in a very sensitive position and they haven't really reached much in their whole investigation of the hate crime. So I feel like if we could do something, that'd be great because I know that their family has had a great impact on Amherst for a long time. Yeah, I, I'd reached out to the New Haven, their human rights commission. And I got the, I, got, I, I think I got a canned response is what I got. And then no follow-up, so. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know if, like, just a statement would be enough, or if anyone has any thoughts. Yep, go ahead. Uh, so I wasn't at the last meeting. Can you fill me in a little bit? So I don't know the exact date, but um, Franklin and his girlfriend were out late night in New Haven. I think it was on Yale campus. Basically what happened was 
um, they were in an interaction between a group of college students. Um, I don't really know if they attended Yale or their affiliation, but they were there. They interacted on a sidewalk. And what occurred was that these group of white males, it, they were the age of college students, not sure if they went to Yale, but what happened was there was an exchange of words and he was called slurs. And then it led up to him being beat. And unfortunately he was left on the sidewalk and when police were called, they didn't really do much. So they asked for witnesses to help them out. And then he got transferred to the hospital. He had to get jaw surgery as well as um, other operations done on his mouth. And so far the investigation hasn't reached to a point where they feel like they have gotten the justice. Um, I don't know much. I'm still trying to learn more. Um, my family is very close with them, so I just feel like I wanted to do something, whether that is help in some way, help acknowledge maybe, I don't know, I don't know, like, you know, like what we can do as a whole commission, but I just want to like at least acknowledge because I know that a bunch of us love Bueno Isano and I know that their family has collaborated with so many locations of Bueno Isano. And even though that's not why I wanna help them in particular, I feel like when it comes to, you know, hate crimes, we're the commission that people go to. And I just don't want them as an immigrant family to feel like that is not something that they don't have the right to. And the last thing I want to do is put them in a place where just because it was outside of our town that they can feel ignored. So I just, I, you know, I just want to open up to you guys, see what we can do. Yeah, thank you so much, Victor, for bringing that up. And I will say on my behalf, I am sorry that that did slip my mind and that we did not come up with anything on the agenda for tonight, but this definitely does deserve the attention that you are speaking to. And I do hear Ben as to putting out a statement about it. I do hear that also that I don't know if that is enough that we can do. So maybe if we could collectively think on this, that'd be great. Oh, maybe. If, and I mean, I think it would be worthy of sending it to the campus as well. And no if the campus has either an ombudsman's person or a human rights commission or something similar, possibly. I mean, I'm just trying to think. Um, yeah, I was going to say we could send. I don't know. I don't know which would have more teeth like if we petitioned the uh, the Human Rights Commission in New Haven, or if we just sent them like a letter, I don't want to say demanding action, but at least asking them to do something because they have a more, I don't want to say active Human Rights Commission down there. Their, their Human Rights Commission has lawyers. You know what I mean? So, so I'm not sure if I got blown off or if they were in the process of doing something, but I feel like it's been roughly a month or next week, it'll be a month and I haven't heard anything back. So we can also, I can also talk to Pamela about it tomorrow yeah. um, to see what she thinks might be some of the the best actions to take. And then, so is there stuff that the family needs at this time? I mean, I this is a lot, right? And so I know it's, it's hard to be like, oh, how can we help? It's hard to articulate what that help might look like. And it's also hard, you know, when people are helping you in ways that you don't really need at that time. So, um, yeah, what are your thoughts, Victor? Um, so to my current knowledge, I know that they have a GoFundMe posted and they already exceeded their amount. So I I know personally from their family, they they are very appreciative of everything. And right now what they just want is advocation because they're not they don't like Ben is getting the feedback from the Human Rights Commission over there. The police is very negligent with them when it comes to the process and informing them of what they can actually do. And I also want to inform myself, but also all of us of the current state of how we can prioritize, how we can elevate, you know, the, the, the status of the investigation. And I, I feel like, you know, already us talking about it is more enough. They just wanted me to bring it up and see if we could do anything. And if we can, I feel like that on the tone is more than they've asked for, but I can and then I get you guys in. I wonder if the human rights, a letter from the Human Rights Commission to the family itself, a letter of support to them. 
Well, that's what I was going to say. And then maybe a letter to the editor or a letter to Yeah. We could, you know, it, we could also do something on a, a mass press release for it too. I mean, because we're thinking now, like there's the indie, there's the reminder, there's all these smaller papers that people are definitely um, reading that uh, as a new ways to let people know, you know, outside of the Gazette. Yeah, I think that that would definitely bring attention and we can also post the letter on our uh, website page also of support, just like we did with um, the July 5th incident and the war on Ukraine and just have people aware of situations happening. Yeah. Um, anybody want to take on this letter of support? I could definitely help out, especially because I know that most of them do only speak Spanish. And the articles that have been written are only in English. So it's very hard for them to kind of, you know, get that language barrier. So at least if we are reaching out, we can reach, you know, we can write it both in English and maybe I or someone else could also, you know, translate it. So it's more direct to them and acknowledging them. And that's great. There, I'm trying to think of it. There was a Spanish newspaper. Like I would see copies of it at, the bank center, All right? And so I'm, I'll am i have to see if I can go. I'm, I thought it was the soul, El Sol, but I'm, I'm looking and I don't, oh. Yep, it is El Sol Latino. So that might be a, a good place to, um, send a letter of support to as well. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be great. Does anybody want, I'll want to partner up with Victor to help write draft? When are, when are we looking to get this draft or something out as soon as possible? Yeah. I think that'd be best. I can help. I can help write it. Thank you. Both. Yes, thank you both. I the only reason why I hesitated was just because my week is a little bit jam packed here at the ending of it. But if you need any advice or guidance, I can make myself available. And I believe Victor, you have my cell phone. And if you don't, just send me an email and I'll give it to you. And in the meantime, I will try to come up with a list of different places where we can post. Um, I wasn't aware of that, so um, I'm, it, it is a little bit concerning that there's a, probably a, a lot of folks who aren't aware of it, and so. Um, we definitely need to share that as well. And that might be something to bring up to the CSSJC and the, well, not the HR, but the CSSJC as well. Yeah, I'll make sure to do so at the next meeting here, I believe. Although I see um, the co-chair Allegra Clark is here, so maybe <laughs> she will relay that. Awesome, I will relay it in an email and Allegra, you can hear her right now. <laughs> And thank you, Victor, for remembering that. Yes, thank you so much, Victor. Does anybody else have anything that they want to bring up before we adjourn here? Um, I just, Victor and Juliana, Juliana, when you um, complete it, you can forward it to me, well, forward it to me, and then um, I can get, we can get it out. Look at the HRC going to 835. Check you guys out. Yeah. Man, you were my dependable an hour and a half, and that's it. All right. 
<laughs> All right. Well, then I will motion to adjourn. Second. Awesome. And we don't need a vote on that, right? Okay. I just Perfect. need a time. Meeting adjourned at 835. Perfect. Have a great week, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Have Bye. a great month. We'll Bye. see you soon. <laughs> I was going to say two of you, I'll see next week. Um, yes, wait, wait. So I know that we adjourned, but real quick, I also forgot. I, Liz, is the Martin Luther King Breakfast Committee having a breakfast this year? That's a great question. One that I don't have the answer to, and I will find out. And if so, do the members want to attend? Because we can get you tickets through the HR, as HRC members. And I'll bring it up to CSSJC and everybody else. Yeah. Definitely. All right. Oh, I might not even be around. No, I won't be here that day. If it's the 14th, I won't be around. Oh, rats. Okay, guys. My notes. All right. Have a good night. Have a good night, everybody. See you. All right, people.